It really is such a joy to pray together and to worship together as a community. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Laura, and I'm the children's pastor here at Pilgrim Church, and I recently started, and it's been such a delight to get to know some of you here already, and I'm looking forward to getting to know more of you as time goes on. Have you heard the song called Happy? It was written about 10 years ago by Pharrell Williams. Remember it? Yes, it brings a smile to your face if you know it. He wrote it for that movie called Despicable Me. It actually did quite well on the charts in a few countries. It reached number one for a few weeks or so. One of the lines in this song goes, clap if you feel like a room without a roof, and clap along if you feel that happiness is the truth. This idea of happiness and joy, it's a common goal for many people in Vancouver and around the world and throughout history as well. We're in a sermon series right now, which is called Flourish. We're looking at the ways that we can flourish in Christ. And if you were here last week, Pastor Joss was preaching from John 15. That's the text that talks about how Jesus is the vine and we're the branches. And he's calling us to bear fruit. We're going to carry on in this chapter today. And I invite you to open up your Bibles to John 15, starting at verse 8 or an app if that's what you use. And if you're willing and able, please stand for the reading of the gospel. I'll be reading from the NIV translation. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this, so my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends, for everything that I learned from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Let's take a moment to pray together. Join me in prayer. Living God, we thank you for this opportunity we have to worship you. We're so grateful to be here together as a community and for this freedom that you give us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the vine and we are the branches and that you call us to bear fruit. We pray, Father, that during this time together, you would open our eyes to see how great you are. Open our ears to hear you speaking to us and open our hearts to you and your ways. We pray all of this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Right in verse 8 in this passage of scripture that we just read, Jesus says for the second time that he wants for his disciples and his followers to bear fruit. He said that earlier um, in the chapter as well. Many theologians believe that the fruit that Jesus is referring to is the fruit of the Spirit. As the Holy Spirit lives in us, there is fruit that results. I'll read from Galatians 5, 22. It says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. In this message today, we're going to focus especially on joy as it relates to flourishing and this fruit of the Spirit. Now, many people in our culture tend to use the word happiness and joy interchangeably, and then other people in our culture like to distinguish between the two. I'll read something that Henry Nouwen wrote, which I appreciate. This is something that he wrote. He said, Joy is essential to the spiritual life. Jesus reveals to us God's love so that his joy may become ours, 
and that our joy may be complete. Joy is the experience of knowing that you are unconditionally loved and that nothing, sickness, failure, emotional distress, oppression, war, or even death can take that love away. Joy is not the same as happiness. We can be unhappy about many things, but joy can still be there because it comes from the knowledge of God's love for us and that nothing can take God away from us. As we lean into exploring this idea of joy today, there will be two main movements in this message. First, we'll look at joy in friendship, and then secondly, joy in obedience. I'd like to just look at these verses in John 15 a little more closely together, especially as it relates to the ways that God loves us, how Jesus describes this here. Now, if you've heard this before, I encourage you to savor it and be reminded of God's amazing love for you. And if you haven't heard of it before, it's amazing good news. In verse 9, Jesus said that as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. This means that all the ways that the Father loves the Son, and the same amount that the Father loves the Son, this is the way that Jesus loves each and every one of us. And this love is vast and immeasurable and infinite. He loves us so deeply. Then again in verse 9, he said, now remain in my love. Some translations will write that as abide in my love. I like what Frederick Bruner has written about this in one of his books. He said that this phrase, remain in my love, is like saying, make your home in God's love. I love that it's beautiful to make our home in God's love, to settle there and to live there. In verse 13, Jesus goes on to say that greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. A sacrificial love. And we know that a short while after Jesus said these words, he made his way to the cross. Voluntarily, he chose to let himself be killed there, and he absorbed our sin and shame on our behalf. He demonstrated his great love for us. In verse 15, Jesus goes on to say, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know the master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from the Father, I (laughs) I called you for everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. Jesus, part of the master's business, God the Father's business, that Jesus shared with his disciples that day was about his journey to the cross and all the reasons for it, and what it would mean. And it included other things as well. And This is what Jesus does with us still today. He still likes to talk to us about the master's business, about what God is saying to us, about his journey to the cross, and in many other areas as well. When I was in grade five, I attended a public school in Saskatoon. And I remember one day in grade five, all of the grade five students were gathered together into the gymnasium for a special assembly. And there were three or four people from the Gideon Association who came that day to our assembly, to our school, and they spoke to us about the value of scripture. They spoke to us about the importance of reading the Bible. And they gave each grade five student a copy of the Bible, a New Testament with Psalms. Did anyone else receive a free Bible as a child in elementary school? Those are the days, right? The good old days in terms of public schools. And and they also, while we were there, they challenged us to read the Bible every day. Something in my heart was stirring that day. The Holy Spirit was working in my heart that day. And I felt drawn to read scripture. And I took up this challenge. I took up the challenge to read the Bible every day. And this is something that I did for several years, almost every day. It's not something that I saw my parents do. I don't have any memories of my parents reading the Bible when I was growing up. But my parents did take me to Sunday school almost every week. And there were some amazing volunteers there who taught me about Scripture and different genres, and the history, and how it kind of worked together. And so I was able to make enough sense of it 
as a child, and I could hear God speaking to me. When I was in high school, I rebelled for a few years or a couple years. And then when I was in my early 20s, I felt the Spirit drawing me back to himself, and he was drawing me back to this regular rhythm of reading Scripture every day. And so it's been very life-giving, something that I've done for many years. Reading the Bible is more than reading words on a page. We know that Scripture is alive and active, like it says in Hebrews 4.12. Almost every day when I'm reading the Bible, there will be a few words that jump out at me. A few words that, or a few verses that seem to become bigger, in a sense. And this is the way of the Holy Spirit speaking to me. This is the way that Jesus speaks to me about the master's business, about his love for me, about his journey to the cross and what that means, providing me guidance in a variety of ways and hope and encouragement and strength as well. And these times that I read scripture, I sense a personal connection with Jesus. I sense a friendship with him. And two-way communication. Two-way communication is is crucial for friendships. So when I'm reading scripture, I listen to Jesus speak to me through the words of scripture. And then I speak with him as well in prayer. And this fosters a friendship with him. It seems very real to me. And this friendship is incredibly important to me. Incredibly life-giving. This is something actually that's unique to the Christian faith, this friendship that we can have with Jesus, who's also the creator of the universe. If we read scripture, if you read the Bible and study it together with other people here or in another community, we can learn about a Christian worldview. As we study scripture, we can learn this worldview. A worldview is a system of thought, a way of seeing things. We can learn about this Christian worldview, which does help us to make sense of the world. And there are many worldviews around, right? There's a Buddhist worldview, Mormon, Islamic. There are secular worldviews as well. There are so many. If you were here last week, Pastor Joss was was speaking about a worldview, expressive individualism. And these are important and helpful for some people. There are similarities and differences between the various worldviews, for sure. Now, if you haven't heard Pastor Joss's sermon from last week, I encourage you to listen to that online. It's very helpful and insightful. But there's something that's unique in our Christian faith. Because Jesus does offer us a worldview, but in addition to this, he also offers us friendship with him. It's huge. If someone upholds another worldview or upholds or agrees with expressive individualism, they're not being offered a friendship as well with Jesus, who we know also created everything. I wonder if you have heard this analogy about a car that is related to this topic that we're talking about. Imagine that you're driving in a large city that's unfamiliar to you. So you're in your car, it's maybe your own, or maybe you're renting it. Imagine that you need to be at a certain destination in this large city at a certain point of time, point in time, and it's really important to you. You really want to be in this place at a certain time. Imagine that for some reason your GPS has failed, that your phone battery died, you don't have any way to recharge it. Have you ever had to pull over and ask someone for directions for this place that you want to be at a certain point of time? So imagine for a moment that you do this. You pull over, you find someone to talk to, and they write down, maybe they will scribble down the instructions for you on a piece of paper, or maybe they'll give you verbal instructions, and then you're going to try your very best to remember them when you get back in your car. Wouldn't it be amazing If that person who knows how to find that destination would get into the car with you and give you instructions a step at a time for wherever you're going. And this is what Jesus does for us. It's not that Jesus just gives us a map because a worldview or scripture could be seen as a map for how to live life. 
It's not that Jesus just gives us a map and then leaves us on our own. What Jesus does is he gets into the car with us. And he climbs right into our lives. And he gives us guidance and instructions and directions. Usually a step at a time towards our destination and on the journey there. And while he's in the car with us, we get to know him. And we become friends with him. This is what he's offering to us. This is what he desires. We see in verse 11 as well that this friendship leads to joy. He said, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. I wonder today if you feel that you experience friendship with Jesus. And if you say, yes, this is your experience, I encourage you to keep prioritizing it. Continue fostering that friendship. Continue your two-way communication with Jesus, your closest friend, through reading scripture and listening to his voice, speaking to you about the master's business as you read, and also speaking with him in prayer. Or maybe you find that you understand this idea of being a servant of Jesus, but you're not sure if you've experienced friendship with him. Or maybe this is a completely new idea for you, this idea of friendship with Jesus. Maybe you haven't heard of that before. That happened to me. I was about 24 before I finally heard about that concept. And if you find that you would like to experience friendship with Jesus, but haven't done so yet, simply ask God for that. Simply pray and ask God to help himself reveal himself more and more to you. Tell him that you'd like to experience friendship with Jesus, and he's happy to answer that prayer. He wants to be your closest friend. He wants you to experience joy as you abide in him and remain in his love. Let's move to a second movement now, which is joy in obedience. It's interesting, isn't it? In these few verses here that we read together, Jesus is talking about friendship, and then he also says he wants for us to obey him. That's a unique friendship. We don't normally obey our friends like Jesus is asking us to do. But of course we know that Jesus is the creator of the universe, so it's a unique friendship. He is God, and so it's unique in that way. I'm going to just read quickly from verse 14 here. It says, you are my friends if you do what I command. Jesus reminds us as well in this portion of scripture that he also obeys the Father. And then he also wants for us to obey him. Now, there's an important principle about obedience and love that's important to keep in mind. And it's been spoken about and written about by many people throughout the years. I'm going to read something that St. Augustine wrote about this. It is not that we keep his commandments first and then he loves us, but that he loves us and then we keep his commands. I feel this is crucially important. It's not that we earn God's love through obedience. It's not what it is. He loves us unconditionally. What, ha- what it is about is that as we remain in God's love, his love and his Holy Spirit transforms us. And that uh, the obedience becomes a natural outgrowth of experiencing God's love. This, in, script, in this part of scripture here, Jesus is really focusing on one of the commandments he considers to be very important. And this is the commandment to love each other. Of course, it's mentioned actually twice in this small, short passage. And it's mentioned throughout scripture in a variety of places. For example, it's mentioned in Mark twelve thirty one, which Jesus describes as the second most important commandment that we love each other, that we love our neighbors as ourselves. Now, John the Apostle, who wrote this gospel, also wrote some letters we find later on in the New Testament. This is what he wrote in 1 John 4, 11 and 12. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. And then John 13, Jesus says, John 13, 35, Jesus says that people in our city, people in our neighborhoods 
will know that we're Christians by our love. It's hugely important to him. Sometimes it's easy to love people around us here in our community or in our, at work, in our neighborhoods, wherever we might be in our city. Sometimes it's easy to love people. Maybe we're compatible with them. Maybe we have similar goals. And at other times it can be more challenging to love other people. It's helpful, I believe, to remember this idea of making our home in God's love. We could imagine possibly a very large well filled with divine love. And as we make our home there in God's presence, as we remain in his love, it's like we can draw from this well of divine love and then share it with others. As we experience God's love, this can be like a strength for us, like a resource that we can draw on when we find it challenging. And it's not that we're ever going to be perfect. None of us are ever going to be perfect in this life. We're human. We're going to make mistakes. And when this happens, we also know that the Apostle John wrote in 1 John that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and he'll forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In this portion of scripture, we are learning that there is a connection between obedience and joy and flourishing. And this is also written about in Psalm 1. So I'd like to read a few verses for you from Psalm 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners stand, or sit in the company of mockers but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That, tree, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. So this tree that we can imagine here that the psalmist is writing about, this tree is planted by streams of water This tree is bearing fruit, and its leaves are not withering. It's a picture of flourishing. And here we see that the psalmist is describing, God is saying to us, that the person who's like a tree by the streams is the one who delights in the law of the Lord, it says. I heard a sermon about this a few years ago, and the preacher said that that phrase Delighting in the law of the Lord is like saying, God, I love it when you tell me what to do. I don't know if you've ever said that. Anyone ever say that to God? God, I love it when you tell me what to do. I believe that the person who can say, God, I love it when you tell me what to do, is the person who is understanding how much God loves him or her. If we really understand the vast measure of God's love, it's easier to trust him, and it's easier to obey him. And we know that God, he's not going to ever tell us to do something that is ultimately harmful. We can trust him in this. And as we trust him in this, we, be, we can become like this tree by, by streams of water, and we can experience more and more joy and flourishing. This idea of obedience is very countercultural, right? It's many people in our culture will kind of get their back up about this idea of having to obey someone or having to obey Christ. But let's look at this in a certain way. Let's look at this uh, look a little more closely. How many of you here have heard of Arthur Erickson, the architect? Can you put your hands up? He's a famous architect. He was born in Vancouver. He went to UBC. He designed some very beautiful and amazing structures and buildings and spaces, including the Museum of Anthropology at UBC, some buildings at SFU, Robson Square, Macmillan Bloedel Building, and many others. Now, as an architect, when Arthur Erickson was designing these amazing spaces, he obeyed the laws of physics so that it would be safe for people to go into those buildings. And as Arthur Erickson obeyed the laws of physics, he had the freedom to create amazingly beautiful buildings and spaces and structures 
that many people enjoy. And the same can be said about music as well. When my husband and I were raising our two little boys, we had a piano in our home. And I remember the first few times they would sit up on the piano bench and make sounds as toddlers pressing various keys, which soon progressed to just using their whole hands as they were playing the piano. It's so cute. But they were not following any of the laws of rhythm or the principles of harmony. It's completely random. And let's compare that with the amazing piano players that we have here. As they, they are following the laws of rhythm, the principles of harmony. And as they do that, they have the freedom to improvise and to create some beautiful music together with the worship team. And so too in our lives, for each and every one of us. As we obey the laws that Jesus gives us, and these commands to love one another, we experience the freedom of joy and flourishing in him. And this experience of joy and this this goal of happiness, however you want to define this, is something that almost every human being seeks for, looks for in a variety of ways. And there are people from a variety of worldviews that, uh, that people hold on to that agree with this or see it in this way. Aristotle wrote, all people seek happiness. There are no exceptions. Even the Dalai Lama thinks that the purpose of life or the goal of every human being is happiness. So people from different worldviews are recognizing throughout history that Most people, many people, really desire joy. It's just that they're looking for it in in a variety of different ways. I, I love what we have here as our vision and mission statement. It says that we exist to love our city and invite our neighbors to flourish. I love that. I'd like to read something for you that C.S. Lewis wrote about this topic in his book called Mere Christianity. This is what he wrote. A car is made to run on petrol. That is, a gas-powered car is made to run on petrol. And it would not run properly on anything else. Now, God designed the human machine to run on himself. He himself is the fuel our spirits were designed to burn or the food our spirits were designed to feed on. There is no other. That it is why it is, not, is, it is just no good asking God to make us happy in our own way without bothering about religion. God cannot give us a happiness and a peace apart from himself because it's not there. There is no such thing. So I agree with, I agree with C.S. Lewis in this. And we know that our friends and neighbors... And people we work with are likely really seeking after joy in some way. And like C.S. Lewis said, the way that they can find true joy is in friendship with Christ and in obedience with Christ and being attached to the vine and growing in this fruit. And part of loving, like our vision statement says, part of loving our city and part of inviting our neighbors to flourish includes sharing Jesus with them or sharing our faith in Christ with them in some way. And I'd like to invite you to consider who you could pray for this week and this summer. Are there some friends or neighbors that you could pray for that they would come to know Jesus if they don't already know him? That they would experience friendship with him? That they would make their home in his love and that they would taste this joy and flourishing that he's offering. I'd also like you to consider inviting some of your friends and neighbors and just praying to ask God, is there someone that you could invite along to one of our community gatherings? You could invite them to worship services on Sundays. There's going to be two picnics this summer. In addition to that, three barbecues. There's so many opportunities. So I invite you to prayerfully consider, is there someone that you can invite along? And that could be a first step in them getting to know Jesus and experiencing joy and flourishing in him. Of course, there's other ways, too, that
that the Holy Spirit might lead you to share your faith with others. I love that song that Josh kindly uh, led the worship in today called Happy from the Inside Out by Porter's Gate. In this song, clearly they're, they're using the words joy and happiness interchangeably. It was based on Psalm 16, remember, from the message version of the Bible. Have you ever, one of those lines that we sang said, ever since you took my hand, you've become my closest friend. So my question for you today, is Jesus your closest friend? And if he's not, just go ahead and pray for that. We also sang happy from the inside out, happy from the outside in. I wonder if that's your experience, experience of joy, maybe closer to what Henry Nouwen wrote about. Are you walking on the right path? We sang, we sang are you walking from, on the right path, the life path? And the right path is the path of obedience to Christ. It's the path of loving other people around us. And the life path, path is the life of increasing joy that we can experience in Christ as individuals and as a community. I invite you to pray together with me. Living God, we love you. We are so grateful for your presence with us and your amazing love for us. We pray, God, that each person here would remain in your love, that we would be attached to the vine who is Jesus. We pray for each person here to experience friendship with you, that you, Lord Jesus, would be everyone's closest friend. We pray, God, that you would help us to obey you as well. Help us to love people around us and however you are leading us to do so. Help us to grow in this experience of joy and flourishing for your glory and also for our good. We pray all of this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.